All right, well, thank you guys so much for coming. Um, I'm going to be talking a bit about my dissertation research. Um, and I've actually redone this PowerPoint a couple of times. And, and uh, partway through the last revision, I realized that uh, I wanted to actually approach it in a different way. So you guys are, are, are going to be sort of uh, part of an experiment, I guess, uh, with me today. Uh, so it may go horribly awry, and uh, if that happens, I firmly blame Jeff Clark in the back and, and Bill Dolly over there for uh, inviting me to do this. <laughs> um, but what I'm going to talk about today uh, is my dissertation research, um, and I'm also going to talk about how I got to the questions that I wanted to ask with my dissertation research. So in some level, this is going to be I guess what you could call an autobiography of a researcher and uh, that research, sort of the historiography of how uh, questions uh, develop in the, in the archaeological world. Um, and to do that, uh, we're going to we're gonna have to go back to the mid-1990s and in, in the early 2000s in Wisconsin. Um, so here we go. So I grew up in... Uh, <laughs> in a town called Wisconsin Dells, Wisconsin. Is anyone from the Midwest? Yeah, there's clapping. Everyone's ridden uh, the water parks and the boats up in the Dells. Uh, it's a big tourist uh, destination, uh, but it's a very small town of about 2,000 people um, with, uh, with a large indigenous population right there. Thank you, Bill. Okay, so the mid-1990s and early 2000s in Wisconsin, and this is a bit of a confessional too, so there's uh, some of my past that most of you don't know and some of my colleagues don't actually know that's gonna pop up in here, so. Uh, Jeff had, had queried me at a party at my house about three years ago asking where a missing decade of my life was. And, and this will be some of it, but there's still a few years that I'm holding back, Jeff, for, for other things. All right, so <coughs> that's me. Um, for about, from about 25 years ago to about 15 years ago, I was involved in the, the rave scene, or the beginnings of the rave scene in the United States. Um, and, and as you can see, I was a, a DJ and I'd also put on some of these raves that would happen in, in warehouses and in other uh, sort of informal uh, settings. And the, the early rave scene uh, was, was definitely founded on some fairly occult ideas and interactions. And it was uh, built up of decentralized groups of people uh, who all sort of came together as equals to create a, a space separate from the rest of society, and in many ways, the DJ was treated as a shaman in these situations. <laughs> but the raves were, were interesting because on the, on the outside, they basically just looked like a giant uh, hedonistic party. But they were really kind of founded on uh, some subversive ideas. And, and these parties could go from 12 hours through to multiple days, and this is actually uh, myself and two of my friends, Mike Kenzie and Katie Webb, who are both doing very well. Katie's wearing pants that she homemade uh, from Teddy Ruxpin uh, sheets, so there's definitely a do-it-yourself aesthetic to these parties. Um, one of the main things that was really central to uh, these early raves in the, in the 90s and the early 2000s was a rejection of, of societal control. And you can see uh, I've got a red circle around uh, or a wristband that I'm wearing, and, and this is just a highlight of what that wristband say, but what, what these parties were, what these raves were, were actually a part of a global and decentralized social movement that was trying to apply ideas that were formulated by this gentleman named Hakim Bey, and I'll get into him in, in just one second. Hakim Bey is a very complicated person. He's despicable in a lot of levels, and I won't go into why some of that is, but he's also incredibly intelligent and he's a keen social critic with a lot of good ideas. And he came out of uh, a lot of the communes from the, the 1960s. And while he was in these communes, he started to recognize that uh, there was a social and political tactic for creating temporary spaces that elude, I guess you could, uh, formal structures of, of control, the state in, in this instance. And he called these things temporary autonomous zones. And he, for a long time, argued that you couldn't actually make these permanent, that there are no such things as permanent autonomous zones. And he's since uh, changed his mind on that. But a lot of people started to 
leverage his ideas and that the best way to create a non-hierarchical system uh, of social re relationships was to create or uh, was to, to focus on the present period to what's happening right now and to not really uh, try and make it permanent to uh, Im impose uh, uh, time on it, I guess. Um, and this is a, an actual mur mural that someone had, had painted of, of Hakim Bey. And so in, in many ways what he was arguing for was people who were disenfranchised from society would be able to find a temporary uh, place where they could actually be enfranchised and they could be em empowered. So this is the foundations for uh, that social movement, which has since uh, turned into essentially just clubbing and, and partying. But it's also the foundation for uh, what this is probably a fairly recognizable image to, to a lot of you is the Burning Man Festival that happens out in, in the Nevada desert and originated on the beach, basically, in California. And this has arguably changed and has become uh, uh, co-opted uh, by many things itself. So that's my background. Um, and perhaps unsurprisingly with that background, when I got into anthropology, what I really wanted to study, wh or wh what I really wanted to be, was a social cultural anthropologist. Um, and uh, in, in particular, one who focused on, on subcultures. And I was really interested in seeing the dynamics and the intersections of ideas and, and functions between uh, hippies and goths and punks and, and, uh, and, and ravers and, and, and skaters, and, and the list goes on and on. There's a lot of count countercultural groups. And just real briefly, one thing to point out here is that in, of interest is a lot of these things are actually centered around public participatory ritual. Everyone gets together and that's where these cultures are kind of formed for, are, are within these uh, music gatherings. But I eventually moved out west. And it, my lovely wife was gracious enough to come with me. It would have been awkward if she hadn't. <laughs> But, uh, and this is uh, a, a sign actually found in the parking lot of UNM uh, that someone was using to hitchhike out west, and I have, I've kept it. It's, it's, I, I find it pretty, pretty wonderful. But while I was taking social cultural classes, I was lured uh, away from anthropology by, by the, uh, the, <laughs> the promise of fieldwork in archaeology, and uh, I, I felt I absolutely fell in love with it, with with the actual process of being out in the field, as well as uh, what the material record uh, holds. But in the process of transitioning my interest from uh, uh, social cultural anthropology into archaeology, I, I, I kind of got gave up on this idea of following uh, countercultures and, and subcultures. And eventually, I graduated from UNM and I got a job with the Santa Fe National Forest. And up there I was recording, uh, I was working for Mike Bremer and Jeremy Kulishek, and I was recording uh, uh, sites from the Guyana archeological culture that Bill had talked about and showed the, the magazine for. And, and that, that uh, archeological culture goes from about AD 1100 to 1300. And while I was working up there, I was of course reading up on uh, a lot of the published literature on, on this area so I could know more about what was what was happening and, and be a better field archeologist. And, and what I found, and you'll notice that there's a substantial difference between this image and the one Bill uh, had showed, is that there is a subtext to a lot of the articles that I was reading about the Gaina. And, and I, uh, Kathleen Bader is here. Kathleen did a really wonderful job of, of uh, bringing my ideas to, to light. And, and so we kind of distilled the subtext uh, to, to take away the sub part of it. Uh, but a lot of research were, were, were treating the Gaina as if they were simply wildlings or prehistoric analogs to meth-smoking hillbillies, I guess you could say. Um, and they treated them as if it was a region that was completely out of control and, and on outside of social sanctions. Uh, but, but part of that has to do with the level of violence that's up in this region. And what they were doing was essentially equating violence with, with chaos. But what we know, uh, as what anthropologists and archaeologists have, have figured out and what sociologists know and pretty much every social researcher that's out there, every, across the board, is that violence is almost exclusively 
uh, controlled through social systems. And there are instances where it's not, and we get really mad when those uncontrolled violent periods pop up, and, and those people get dealt with quickly and, uh, and unpleasantly, and it doesn't usually end up in this pathological uh, culture of, of unexplainable violence. And so I started to question these ideas that I was reading about in the literature with what I was seeing on the ground. And what I was seeing on the ground is that the archaeological record really kind of showed a very sophisticated group of people who were doing something a lot different than what their neighbors were doing. It, was, it just looked a lot older. So people were starting out from an I this idea of treating them as sort of out of touch, I guess. As I started to look at the disconnect between what the Gaina were doing, and I'll actually talk about that here in a second, and, and what their neighbors were doing, I realized that uh, there's something very cool that we can see with the archaeological record, and that's that there actually are revolutionaries and countercultures in the Southwest. <laughs> there is a subversive archaeology. Uh, and this is uh, a, a water painting or watercolor done by a, f a friend and colleague and, and uh, uh, a woman who works with Archaeology Southwest uh, as well. She runs the, uh, the excavation portion of, of the, our field school uh, w and, and under Karen Schulmeyer. And her name's Leslie Aragon. And this came out of a conversation that we're all having about uh, the standard scenes that you see in, in archaeology. And, and so Leslie flipped it. And this is, of course, gender subversive, right? So the man's grinding the corn and the woman's coming in with the deer. And in this instance, it's also species subversive because the dog's chasing the little boy. <laughs> <laughs> but thinking about how, what the Gaina may have actually been, I started to ask myself, what would social movements look like in the archaeological record? What would countercultures look like in the archaeological record? And how can we see them? And so to do that, I'm going to pull us back to about 40,000 feet. And so here we have the Southwest with all of its myriad of environmental differences and, and, and uh, biomes. And with, uh, overlaid across that or existing within it are, are a lot of different archaeological groups, people who live their lives in, in, in many ways in very similar ways and in other ways very different ways. And a lot of what we're seeing on, on this map are differences uh, that we've recognized based on differences in material culture. As I started examining how these people were interacting through time, uh, you start to see that there are changes in centralization of religion and of religious and political uh, control. And one of the ways that I looked at that was looking at the control of space, and that's sacred space versus secular space. And as those things we're separated, you start to get to a position where people can actually control the ritual space. They can control the religious knowledge and religious organization. And that allows them to have control of, an, uh, of access and dissemination of ritual knowledge. And in many ways then, the more separated that the sacred space and secular space is, then the more hierarchical that uh, what amounts to a political organization within the religious organization is. And I'm, I'm gonna, flip-flop back and forth between religious and political organizations, mostly because in, almost, in most of the times that we're looking at, they're, they're I don't want to say interchangeable, but politics and political power is embedded within religion and religious power. And as you get into these multi-use spaces where your, your domestic habitation is actually your uh, sacred space as well, then that's where we start to see a decentralization and a lack of control over religious power and religious knowledge. And the, on the hierarchical side of things, we see that, we see in the Southwest this emerge with places like uh, Chaco Canyon, and in the South with, uh, with uh, the Platform Mound communities in the Hohokam period towards the end. And this is sort of just a graphic to easily represent or, or think about how knowledge is controlled within these, within these groups. And on the on your left, my right, uh, is the centralized and hierarchical way of doing things where it's all distributed uh, through one person. And then the opposite of that would be the decentralized, which is on the bottom there, where information can flow freely throughout the system. So in the Mogion area, 
that transition, we, we see this transition from open access to religious knowledge to restricted control of religious knowledge pretty regularly. And it, it goes for, uh, in a, it, with the archaic period with the Cochise culture that starts about 200 BC, which is actually uh, kind of in the middle of the, the far left over here. We don't have a, a pointer, but we're kind of starting about right there. People lived in pit houses, but the sacred and secular space was, for the most part, uh, together. By about 200, uh, which AD 200, which is the early pit house period, we start to see the beginnings of ceremonial architecture up there. And Catherine's probably going to be really mad at me because I'm going to go through this in a very broad, broad stroke. And this is her area for sure. Um, by about AD 550, people are living in rectangular pit houses and great kivas are present. So more and more split uh, from uh, secular and sacred space. By 8900, people are, are fully sedentary, they're aggregated along large river channels, and by a about 1,000, 81,000, uh, we see the kind of eruption of, of classic Mimbris so with its focus on masonry pueblos and uh, communal rooms in pueblos along with plazas. And so we start to see uh, transition away from control of ritual space when, in, when plazas are brought in. By the mid-1100s, most of these large villages in the Mimbris region were abandoned, and uh, people kind of disperse out across the landscape. We see uh, uh, a reorganization of population into small villages. In the ancestral Pueblo region, it's fairly decentralized control of religious knowledge through uh, about, till about 500 AD. And from that period before that to, to 500 AD, we see a lot of, uh, there's a little bit of split between the sacred and secular space. Um, you're starting to see something called proto-kivas, which are, are the beginnings of, of what we know as the uh, kiva society, which by about AD 500, is when uh, a lot of that starts to kick off. And it's associated with an increase in site size as well. We start to see uh, two of the largest villages in that region. Um, Shibikishi has about 70 plus structures. And uh, w by that time we have uh, regular, what we recognize as kivas and structures that are like what we will eventually recognize as great kivas. By AD 750 to 900, uh, villages have become formalized arrangements and they're often called prudent units after uh, the gentleman who uh, described them first. And ceremonial space really starts to split. And it's been split between areas with big houses and those with great kivas. By 900 to 1150, people are increasingly aggregated into larger villages. There's extensive evidence of, great, of kivas and great kivas throughout the region. Chaco Canyon is really kind of at its peak and then it goes through its decline. Around 1150, we see a dramatic decrease in Chaco and related ritual organization, although many great houses across the northern southwest are still in use. At about that time, we start to see increase in hierarchical control and Kiva society in, in the Mesa Verde region, as well as an influx of people into the Mesa Verde region. By about AD 1300, to fit through 80 1500, there are some really dramatic demographic movements and people flow out of the Four Corners region into areas in the south, which we'll talk about in a little bit, as well as into the Rio Grande. And then the Hoacom region, where we're all sitting within the, the basket, I guess, the bread basket of Hoacom down here. For a this is one of the more interesting areas just because it fluctuates so, uh, so frequently, but uh, since about 1500 BC and really before that, uh, people were dispersed across the landscape. And they lived within a fairly or egalitarian social structure. Oh. Starting around zero AD, we start to see these, the uh, beginning of these things that we variably call large houses or, or big houses. And they contain items that you don't see in smaller houses. So they're habitation structures, but they're, they're bigger and they have cooler stuff basically. Um, and it's, it's pretty standardly, we, archeologists generally argue that this is evidence of, the con of people starting to control uh, politics or society and organization within those communities, but it's, it's tampered, it's not, it's not over the top. By the region's colonial period, by about 750 to 950, everyone's been irrigating for a, a very, very long time in this period, so they don't move around quite as much as people do up north. 
But there seems to have been some form of a rejection of that earlier uh, increase of, of hierarchy. And uh, Henry Wallace has written about this in terms of the, the ball court period, and some of you may uh, know a little bit about this, but in the ball court period, you see uh, this dramatic spread across the landscape of these uh, externally or external uh, public architecture um, where everyone can uh, easily participate. And they're easily open, they're visible to all mem members of a community. And at the same time, that also uh, th these structures appear with red on buff pottery. The ball courts were incredibly numerous. There is about 238 ball courts recorded for about 194 sites. Um, and these new social features seem to be accompanied with a rejection of earlier control of ideological practice by these uh, big house residents. By the mid 8100s, or I'm sorry, 81,000s, there seems to be a balkanization of communities around these river drainage. There's an aggregation. People are all starting to pack together. Um, new towns are established, and in the, the ball court system falls out of, of favor. People aren't using them anymore. And about this time, uh, and after, after that, by, by the 1200s, people start building platform mounds and adobe architecture. And these platform mounds are community architecture um, that in some cases also serve as elite residences. Um, these mounds have been argued to demonstrate a replacement uh, of religious power from previous epochs uh, with one of centralized control of religious knowledge. At the bare minimum, it could be argued that platform mounds demonstrate the presence of a hierarchical power structure, which was likely based on ritual knowledge. And so that's, whew, <coughs> that's, a, that's a lot of information and really fast uh, with not a lot of pictures, so I apologize, we'll have some some pictures here coming up. But to kind of contextualize what I was, we we're talking about these sort of fluctuations of up and down that are, that are happening between whether there's a few people in control or whether everyone's sort of able to participate and, and take advantage of, of uh, the, their, their religious and, and uh, political life or be a part of their religious and political life uh, is, is this type of repetition that I think sometimes is, is seen as as cycling, as not progressive, right? We're not moving anywhere, we just keep spinning our wheels. And that was definitely stuck in my head, and then I ran across this card. <laughs> and this repetition is a form of change. And this card itself actually has a really wonderful history that you guys can go home and, and Google. It comes from a, a, a deck of cards called Oblique Strategies that Brian Eno, the musician, had written to help himself get past uh, creative blocks, basically. And, if he can't think of how to make his music better, he just pulls one of these cards out and, <laughs> and, and does whatever, you know, add more echo effect. Or, uh, but in, in, in this, it was repetition is a form of change, and that makes a lot of sense when you actually apply that to social systems as well. Repetition is a form of change. So what if reorganizing these social elements that we see creates a new song, yet the elements remain the same? Why can't, we do, why, why can't we do that with society? How is that not, how is that spinning its wheels, so to speak? And so I'm gonna read you a long quote that comes from this guy. And uh, I think we can all agree that just by looking at this guy, this quote's gonna be long and, and dense, right? <laughs> and this is a gentleman named Pyotr Kropotkin. He's Russian. Um, and he, he wrote this in 1898. Harmony thus appears as a temporary adjustment, established among all forces acting upon a given spot, a provisory adaptation. And it kind of sounds like he's saying this, right? Because his eyes are staring at you. And that adjustment will only last under one condition, that of being continually modified, of representing every moment the resultant of all conflicting actions. Let but one of those forces be hampered in its action for some time and harmony disappears. Force will accumulate its effect. It must come to light. It must exercise its action. And if other forces hinder its manifestation, it will not be annihilated by that, but will end up end by upsetting the present adjustment, by destroying harmony in order to find a new form of equilibrium and to work to form a new adaptation. Such is the eruption of a volcano, 
whose imprisoned force ends by breaking the petrified lavas, which hindered them to pour forth the gases, the molten lavas, and the incandescent ashes. Such also are the revolutions of mankind. Now, Kropotkin was a geographer, uh, and, and so he was really interested in how uh, peasants, basically, uh, were, were overthrowing their, uh, their shackles and, and, and uh, creating new lives for themselves. And so what he's really saying is that tension and change happen when people are oppressed. And when that change happens, it can be sudden. So uh, that's one way that we can look at look for, or start looking for social movements, I guess, is looking for sudden changes because a lot of these transitions into hierarchy are pretty gradual. Uh, when we get things going in the other direction, when we get these periods of decentralization, it happens pretty quick. And oftentimes, archaeologists have written about them as periods of collapse or periods of uh, uh, abandonment and disorganization. And, and so I kind of wanted to query stick my face in there a little bit and, and see what was what was going on. And, and one thing that happens when you uh, put this group, the Gaina that I was talking about, in that sort of uh, fl period of, or, or arc, I guess, of uh, control of religious and thus political knowledge in the ancestral Pueblo region is that you see the kind of pop up right when uh, things are the most hierarchical in the ancestral Pueblo world. And they pop up out of nowhere. This is actually... Uh, a really dense map, but what's important on here is that the Gaina phase is up here, and it's the last period in this sort of transition or this uh, uh, shift of settlement in the upper San Juan region. But no one lived in this region, in the darker green, prior to the Gaina being there. They, they came out of, they, they settled there out of nowhere, mostly, uh, I will talk in just a second who they're related to, but for m multiple reasons, that area was unoccupied. It's really a highland environment. When they settled there, they seem to have come from a lot of different areas. And, and this is part of my dissertation research, and I'm basing this off of the fact that a lot of the foreign ceramics we see in that area are actually not contemporary. They're curated, and they come from different regions. And, and there, there's decent evidence that these may be sort of like the license plates that are on the garages, uh, in uh, the walls of your garages, for those of you who have, have moved and, and lived down here. This is kind of rem remembrance of their homelands. And this is where they settled. And it's gorgeous, and, and it's horrible to survey. Uh, <coughs> and it's full of gamble oak, which just wants to uh, shred your legs, and, and, and choya hiding in the gamble oak. And, and I thought this was the worst place in the world to survey until I surveyed uh, in the Santa Rita Mountains and, and, uh, and had some uh, wonderful experiences with mesquite and acacia. And, and uh, I, 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 I yearn for my time getting torn up by gamble oak instead. But it's gorgeous and there's a lot of resources to be extracted up there and corn can grow up there. And so they start building structures and they don't have very many uh, rock shelters or cliff structures up there. This is one, it's called Nogales. Uh, and that's actually the first view you get of it coming up the, the path through the pine trees. Normally what they do is they build above ground and uh, below ground pit structures, uh, or it's, I'm sorry, below ground pit structures, real pit structures, and then they build structures on the surface that are called unit houses. But you can see the interior is basically the same between these two things. And what's really interesting is that in these habitation structures, they're all habitation structures, you have a lot of religious signifiers. You have things that we think of uh, that are associated with kivas, uh, such as, as murals. They're built in very difficult places. Can you guys see where, where this might be? Uh, we'll zoom in on it here in a second. It's right at the very tip up there. You can see the, the rock pile that is, it's just one, one building. It's one family that was living up there. There, on that mesa, there is about five or six other structures and the only way to get to it was to cross that uh, ridge back, and it's made out of tufa, and it's crumbling, and and uh, it it's hard, kind of hard to think about this on for scale because there's no person in there. But that's me standing on it and looking down, and you can see that it's only about three feet wide. What you might also notice is that there's architectural rubble in here. 
So these guys actually went through, and when that was, it's, it's volcanic tufa again, so it's really soft, it erodes really easily. They built houses on the only access point they have to that mesa. So they're really concerned about access to different areas. Other things that they did was uh, kind of create new material culture. Uh, I, I always joke, uh, some people have heard me say this like six or seven times now, but this is actually a ground stone axe. It's about the size of my hand. And that's pretty standard up there. That's what all their axes look like. Um, and I, I call them the, the world's largest projectile point. But they also started making these uh, conical bottomed vessels uh, that are not normal in terms of what you see in the ancestral Pueblo world or con with the contemporary ancestral Pueblo world. They look a lot older uh, and they uh, in some level harken back to um, burden baskets in, in my mind and, and people have done studies to look at groups that have these point of bottom vessels and a lot of them are, are often uh, not uh, settled groups. They're, they um, travel across the landscape. And then they also have these uh, comb shaft straighteners for, for making arrows. But these are sort of what the Gaina are, are sort of hallmarks for what you expect to see archaeologically for a social movement. It's pe people showing up suddenly, using their feet to vote on changes that they find unpleasant in the area that they started from. And they reorganize their society as they're moving. They're, where these people are moving from, everyone was living in situations where they had kivas and they had uh, habitation. So their, their habitation and, and sacred sp space was split. But these guys brought them back together and they were really harking back to a time hundreds of years earlier. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about uh, a social movement that happens in the South. And this is different than the Gaina, and I'll talk about why it's different than the Gaina. Uh, and this is also part of my dissertation. And this is, of course, the, uh, been a, a focus of research for Archaeology Southwest for uh, a very long time now, 2022-ish, 20, 20 20-some years. Um, and, and, uh, and they've done an incredible job of uh, really figuring out exactly what was going on with what was prior to Archaeology Southwest and a few other researchers like Patty Crown and, and well, really everyone uh, who was working on it for the seven years prior to that uh, helped too, but these guys really started to pull apart uh, the confused mass of, of data that we were dealing with and figure out that this was a archaeological signature, material record of a group that had actually started up north, on, in, up in the Kayenta and Tucson regions. So we're talking about up, up in here. This is that jelly, that greenish jelly uh, bean blob is, is where some of them started at. And this is prior to that group uh, migrating out. And this is a, a work I had actually done uh, with a number of people um, from Barbara Mills' uh, Southwest Social Network Project. And it was me trying to kind of figure out how people uh, react to social and, and environmental crises. And, and one thing that we noticed, this, these colors are basically telling you how connected a uh, group was to the groups around it. And when it's red, they're connected to the other groups. When, so red and orange are connected to the other groups. Blue and green are, are fairly uh, self-sufficient or isolated within themselves, not quite as, not as connected. And you see the Cayenta and Tucson are, are green throughout, and then they're gone. They're ne they never quite pull out and start interacting with the other groups. And eventually what happens there in that last period is sort of that at the end part of, of their migration out of that region because they weren't relying on their neighbors in ways that uh, groups like Hopi were. And so the Cayenta move out and move down south. There's a dispersal of, popu of, of their population across the landscape, and this is a massive uh, dispersal, and I'll show some uh, pictures that, that show that scale in a second here. Uh, but they're a minority population. This isn't uh, like what they're seeing in, in the Santa Fe, or, or the upper Rio Grande Valley, I guess I should say, when people from Mesa Verde are coming down, where you're getting like 20,000 people flowing through, if you uh, agree with that model. Um, this is, a limited number of people moving into some very demographically dense areas like the Phoenix Basin, San Pedro Valley, and Safford Valley. 
These people are socially distant from the people they're moving in with. They do things a lot differently. They, they're from that ancestral Pueblo area moving into the Hoakam area. Their worldviews are, are different. Their religions are different. How they uh, make their pottery is different. I'm sure one of them brushes their teeth from the left and the other one brushes from the right. They're, they're fundamentally different in a lot of ways, but they're also similar in a lot of ways too. One thing that really is interesting that happens with the Kayenta is they never stop interacting with each other. Even though they're spread out uh, through all these communities across the landscape, they keep talking. <coughs> and eventually, you start to see a new type of ceramic uh, pop up. And first, it's a ceramic that we call Maverick Mountain, and it looks a lot like what these guys were making up north, up in the Kayenta and Tucson homelands. <coughs> But eventually, this ceramic turns into what we call salado polychromes. And, and these polychromes are really interesting because they're ideologically charged in a way that a lot of uh, the other ceramics seem not to have been. And Patricia Crown did a study in the mid-90s, 1994, I think it was published, that was, she was trying to figure out what was going on with these salado ceramics on, on the landscape. And one thing she realized is that they're decentrally produced. It means they... they, they they weren't produced in one spot and traded all over the, uh, the southern and southwest. They were produced all over the place. <coughs> and based on a couple of other lines of argument, she actually was, was saying that what she thought was happening with the, these salado polychromes is not that the pots were moving, but that in fact there was ideas on how to make these pots and ideas associated with uh, sort of a social institution around these pots that were getting transmitted from, from place to place. And she called this the Southwest Regional Cult. And basically she was arguing that Salado represents a religion that was spreading across the Southern landscape. And this religion, based on changing diameters and pots getting bigger and bigger and bigger, was really built around people getting together in public, in plazas, and having communal feasts. It was really like a, a, a a, a large public participatory ritual uh, in some ways, like what I was talking about earlier. So this is early on. This is, these uh, dots have various levels of salado polychrome in comparison to other decorated ceramics in them. And the areas that I've circled in black are, are regions where it's 50% it's or more of the decorated ceramic assemblage is salado polychromes. And when they move in, when the uh, Kayenta and Tucson, when the migrants move in to some of these regions, there's a lot of tension. And so this is an image from High Mesa in the San Pedro uh, Valley, which is, which is down here, we're gonna be talking about. And this is actually one of the, the local communities. And there is a mound, uh, right in the center there, and, and here's a, a map of it. And this is a group made up of, of, uh, of what we would definitely call Hoakam. Um, and about the same time, and dating is a little fuzzy in these areas, uh, but pretty contemporaneous with the, the arrival of the, the migrants, you get the these constr construction of these large platform mounds. And this is the foundation for these mounds. And these things originate in the... Phoenix Basin, but they're spreading out into the San Pedro area now. So you have High Mesa, you have a number of sites of locals in the uh, San Pedro Valley. While migrants move in, this is Reeve Ruin, and it's right up on the escarpment up there. And this is a nice uh, image of the a reconstruction of what Reeve Ruin would have looked like. But so there's tension between the, the locals and the migrants. They're not moving into an empty landscape like the Gaina were, right? This is a populated world that they're, they're heading into. And in some levels, that's uh, very important for them because what happens is their message that, the, the message that is encapsulated within uh, the Salado polychrome this, uh, that, that is a part of this public participatory uh, religion, ritual, starts to spread and it spreads out to a number of areas and it spreads out fairly rapidly. We're gonna talk a little bit or just, or just show you a picture here. And so it spreads out into the Mule Creek area where we've been doing field work at with Archaeology Southwest for 
uh, a while with the Preservation Field School. And then it, it shoots down in, in, into the Sulphur Springs Valley area and the San Bernardino Valley area. Who, how many volunteers here worked on the Edge of Slotto project with me? Get some hands up, yeah. So there's a, this was, this is a really interesting area because you can see how far out of the expectation uh, this is. And it just even, it, it, it well, well, we'll talk about it. It's, it's, a, it's a curious area, uh, curiouser and curiouser, as they say. Um, and part of it has to do with the fact that uh, it's not on this map and I don't have time to talk about it because uh, Bill didn't give me all day. Uh, <laughs> but uh, because we have Casas Grandes, the, that really hierarchical and uh, I interesting uh, religious slash political center down in Mexico. But so by about 1350 to 1400, we're, we're st starting to see this kind of movement into these southern areas. And this is the Tucson Basin. By the way, it's, it's kind of hard to read, but this is Tucson Basin. You notice it never really spreads out past the Tucson Basin. It wants to, Salado wants to, if it, if it could make those decisions, but it's a pot, so it can't. <laughs> this is actually in the Sulphur Springs Valley area as well, and this is uh, a, a day Bill and I went out to get a, a, a site ready for uh, uh, the volunteers on the Edge of Salado project to come out. But what I think you can notice is that the the environment that it spreads to, the, like the, the actual uh, uh, biomes that it spreads to are, are pretty dramatically different. It's not, people aren't kind of hindered in, in where they're, they're moving. And these are some images of uh, Roosevelt Redware, Salado Polychrome, that are, uh, would have been used in these uh, large scale uh, kind of participatory feasting ceremonies. And these were the ones that were uh, produced in multiple communities across the, the Southwest. And these are the ones that are spreading and that we're measuring the spread of. And in the background here uh, is what a lot of that data for that map is built off of. And I don't know if you can see it. I, I kind of over cluttered that slide, I think, but uh, it's, it's boxes of sherds. It's boxes and boxes and boxes and boxes and boxes of sherds. Uh, part of the data is derived, the vast majority, I should say vast with, a, uh, I should say vast like seven times maybe, majority of this data comes out of the, the database for the Southwest Social Network uh, project and it's 4.8 million sherds now. So it's, it's, a, it's a very substantial database that while the that, that has a lot of robustness, I guess. We can, and, and it's got a lot of stuff that we can play with. Edge of Salado, that project was uh, really helpful because it actually helped us fill in some small holes within there. And the excavations, because uh, we all firmly believe in preservation archaeology at Archaeology Southwest, the excavations weren't done in to figure out exactly what was happening from... Uh, you know, 9, or AD 1052 to AD 1250 at these sites. It was it was more to sort of target specific areas that we wouldn't damage too much at these sites to to try and help fill in these regional gaps in our understanding, so that we could start doing these sort of uh, evaluations at about 40,000 feet. <coughs> What this, these series of maps show us is that people in different areas in the Southwest are choosing in one form or another to interact uh, to acculturate or to use uh, Salado polychromes. So we can see from the material record choices that people are, are making. And, and the question then is, to, is whether we can get at what those choices mean. Why are they making a choice to pick something up? Why are they making a choice not to pick something up? And this is where I started to th think, well, maybe there's, there's also something political embedded with Salado as well, and it's not simply a religious movement uh, that was spreading across the Southwest focused on inclusion, because what we can start to see is that in some areas, it, it has a lot of trouble moving. In other areas, it moves very well. And the areas that it moves the best, the areas that it spreads the best, are in regions that are actually 
within or, or neighboring uh, fairly hierarchical systems. And, and th this is happening at about the same time that the Hoacom platform mount system is occurring. Uh, and that's a picture of Pueblo Grande up there on the upper left. And, and, and other systems such as the Casas uh, Grandes region. It's, it's, it's moving into these areas. And within social movement theory and, and within sociology and geography, there's a lot of ideas about how you can figure out what social movements are saying <coughs> based on where they're successful. And, and that's, uh, it's, it's called frame alignment theory. It's super boring, so we're not going to talk uh, about the specifics of it. But what I'm basically, what, we're, what you can do is kind of really dig into the fissures of the religious landscape in the American Southwest or in the greater Southwest to see where Salado is effective. It's effective in regions that are hierarchical. It's not as effective in regions that are less hierarchical, that are more egalitarian. And so it seems that this, w with this message of inclusion, there also seems to be a contestation embedded within Salado of uh, hierarchy and a kind of in a, a desire to bring people, to re-enfranchise uh, the, the public, I guess, would be uh, the best way to put it. And some of these areas where it works really well, like in the, uh, where Salado uh, becomes really entrenched, like in the San Pedro Valley, are areas where th that platform mount system is, exists, but it hasn't been there for very long. People would have remembered what it was like to live under a system that was not hierarchical, where they could actually have control of their religious and political power. I would, uh, Aaron Wright and I were actually just talking either yesterday or, or the day before, and I was saying his book was published like a perfect time for me, so I, I thanked him quite profusely for that because he's seeing something similar on the early end of this, that transition from the pre-classic period, that ball court period, and the, the pre-platform mound period into the platform mound period. And I won't give away Aaron's book by, by going into that, but you should buy it. It's good. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so what we have here then with Salado is a contestation of power in the, in the Hoacom platform mound system. And an important side note that I, that I, I seem to have forgotten is that while the, the Salado polychrome, the Salado uh, religious social movement that I've been talking about certainly had its foundation within uh, the migrants that came down from up north, this really is a product of these migrants and the local Hohokam people interacting. It really emerged out of those interactions and it would not have spread like this if it was only moving amongst migrant communities. Okay, so. <laughs> takeaway message. Is there a takeaway message? Uh, so, <laughs> one one of the things that I, I think we we notice when we start actually when we start digging into some of these uh, periods and we start taking account of uh, political power within within religions and we start taking a, account and uh, taking introducing uh, these ideas of, of broken religious landscapes, which Catherine Dungan actually uh, r really highlighted in her dissertation, is, is uh, these ideas that you can, you, you can actually start to figure out and understand maybe not what people were thinking, because I'd get fired almost immediately if I said I knew what people were thinking back then. Right, Bill? Yeah. <laughs> uh, but you can start to figure out why things were successful and what the reason for that success was, which maybe actually is probably just the same thing. But so in the, in the Salado period, or with the Salado religious social movement, it's success based on contestation of hierarchy. With the Gaina, it's success based on contestation of hierarchy. And there's a pattern there, right? Uh, but that pattern is important because it demonstrates that in the Southwest, in certain periods, when things get fairly hierarchical when things get, uh, when you have an elite that's in control of, of religious knowledge and political power, there's often, not always, but there often seems to be, well, I, I take that back. They're generally, uh, I would say always, and that's a lot of uh, adverbs there. So we'll just say always. <laughs> there seems to be a reaction to that in, in one form or another. Maybe that's the better way to say it. it. The shape changes, but the reaction to that hierarchy 
uh, seems to happen on, through time. And it's one of the reasons, I think, and now we're just kind of going into me talking about uh, ideas without necessarily a lot of uh, basis and data, but it's one of the reasons, I think, uh, that the Southwest is actually incredibly important in, under, in understanding uh, worldwide history. And, and Southwestern archaeologists, we really think the Southwest is important. Uh, and the people, uh, the archaeologists across the world have, have uh, agreed with us for a very long time. <laughs> but but they're, they're starting to, in the last 20 to 30 years, we, we haven't been having quite as much of an impact. And, and part of it is because in worldwide archaeology, people have been talking, uh, 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 kind of under, trying to understand these transitions into statehood. And, and the Southwest just doesn't matter in, in, in that area because it's not, there's, we don't really have a state. We never have. There are people who really, really, really want there to be states in the Southwest. They really want there to be states in the Southwest. And, and it, there, there definitely is these periods of state-like thinking where you get uh, centralized control and things like that. But at, at, at the end of the day, we just never ended up with states in the Southwest. And it's not simply built on the fact that uh, some people had horses and we didn't have horses and some people had uh, other livestock that we didn't have in the, in the Southwest here. A lot of it, my argument is, is built on the fact that through time, people in the Southwest are very, very keyed in on restricting control uh, and self aggrandizement of power uh, to a select few people. And so in the Southwest, uh, we have countercultures and we have uh, social movements, and, and they're the reasons that we never moved in, I, I would argue, that we've never moved into these levels of, of, of statehood. And so that's the big thing I want you guys to take away from this talk, is that people can react to people. Uh, people don't just need to react to the environment. And the Southwest is a really powerful and persistent place, and it's like that not because it, it fell out of time, uh, but because it chose to be that way. In many ways, I think uh, social movements are sort of like the engine uh, that's powering history uh, through the Southwest, and, and I would actually argue through a lot of North America. But uh, that's it, thank you. Oh, this is the requisite slide of uh, all my thank yous. And <laughs> So th clearly there are a lot of people that helped me uh, graduate uh, school. So, uh, questions? Yes, ma'am. What, what, what pressures were sort of leading to the success of the hierarchical societies? Oh, okay, well, so I, there's a lot of, so it's not just social movements that are sort of uh, serving to limit those powers. Uh, th there are things like up north with uh, uh, the Kachina religion, the, the advent of that, and I, I would actually argue that that was probably a social movement in, in, in some form or another too. And Chuck Adams uh, describes it as a, 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 a cult or a religious uh, movement that served to aggrandize power for some people, and often they were integrated in the Kiva societies as well. But he also argues at the same time that it was really effective at horizontally uh, integrating uh, communities. So it, it, while it was, it was serving to, Im, uh, to raise up certain people, uh, make some people more equal than other uh, of their equals, um, it was also simultaneously limiting their ability to, to move up higher. So there, there are entrenched social institutions, I think, in a lot of areas in the Southwest that that serve to limit uh, people looking to accrue, accrue power. Does that, does that answer your? No, it doesn't? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, that part of that is, is uh, it, it's, those should actually probably be dashed lines. Uh, for a lot of those, it's just some of them continue, especially in the ancestral Pueblo uh, region. Th there's a lot of fluctuation under the Spanish, of course, but 
uh, the religious institutions at place at that point continue. And, and one of the, th you know, the, the Spanish contact period is actually really interesting for a whole bunch of different reasons, but uh, Matt Liebman from Harvard has, has done a very good job of arguing that, uh, did I go past it? I did. That the, uh, there we go. That, yeah, that should be dotted, like kind of a, a dotted line. It doesn't actually fall down to the, to the bottom there. Um, but Matt Liebman's argued that uh, at the, the 1690 revolt was, was a social movement. And, 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 and it's, you know, this th that's the nice thing about the historical record is, is that it very clearly is, is a, a movement like that. So we know the ability for these people to do that is, is, is present because it, it happened not too long after contact too. So w would environmental uh, conditions have any control over or impact on these, these fluctuations and, and uh, is the question. And, and so my answer to that is, is yes and, and not as much, I think, as we always have argued that they are in the Southwest. Archaeologists, part of the problem with, with archaeology, which is also part of uh, the wonders of archaeology, is that we have some data that's really, really clear cut and easy to see. And, and we sometimes go there instead of trying to dig in through these muddy waters. Uh, and so the environmental record, and there's actually just a paper published in... Uh, Nature Advances, I think, uh, by Basinski et al., um, where they're arguing something similar, which is that uh, up in the, the Four Corners area, the Mesa Verde area, you see, I don't think they actually said social movement within the paper, I, I may have missed it, but in their, in their press releases, they, they talk about how these fluctuations that you're seeing in the Mesa Verde region are a product of, uh, the envir of environmental degradations and, and downturns. Fumi Arakawa for the same region, taking into account those same fluctuations has actually argued that they were, they, they appeared to be uh, rejections of hierarchy in multiple, in multiple forms and in multiple instances. And with the migration, and, and again, this is uh, me paraphrasing other people's work, of course, but uh, the migration out of the Mesa Verde region, people have often talked about how the, one of the reasons that you don't see a lot of the material traits of uh, Mesa Verde uh, archaeological culture in the, the Rio Grande is because it's not the knowledge holders, it's not the people with the power who are moving out first, it's the people who don't have the power, it's the people who are trying to get away from that type of hierarchical system. And by the time those, uh, the, the men and women who had the power in those systems get there, they're the last ones out and they're moving into a society that's already uh, figured out a way to limit their ability to, to accrue more power. Other questions? No, all right. Thank you guys. <laughs>